Take your Bible this morning, if you would, please, and turn to the book of Jude. If you go all the way to the back of the Bible, the book of Revelation, and then take a left, you'll find the book of Jude, right before the last book of the Bible, the book of Jude. There's just one chapter in the book of Jude. We're going to read verses 22 and 23. Jude, verse 22 and 23. And we'll just read these verses in unison together this morning. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. And let's begin on verse 22. Ready? And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. And let's pray together. 
Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture now this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And Lord, we believe that what we hold in our hands this morning uh, is not the words of men or the words of a man. We believe it to be in truth, the words of God. And I pray that we'll allow those words to work effectually in each of us this morning. Thank you already for what we've heard through song and fellowship. I pray you'll bless the special and that you'll tune our hearts to your heart, Lord, that we'll have ears to hear what you want to say to us this morning. It's in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Like a blind man I wandered so lost and undone a beggar so hopeless without god or his son then my savior in mercy heard and answered my cry and oh what a difference since jesus Pass by since Jesus passed by since Jesus passed by oh what a difference since Jesus passed by well I can't explain it and I cannot tell you why but oh what a difference since Jesus Pass by. All my yesterdays are buried in the deepest of the sea. That old load of guilt I carried is all gone. Praise God, I'm free. Looking for that bright tomorrow where no tears will dim the eye. Well, oh, what a difference since Jesus passed by. Since Jesus passed by. Since Jesus passed by. Oh, what a difference since Jesus passed by. Well, I can't explain it, and I cannot tell you why. But oh, what a difference since Jesus passed by. You want to sing that chorus once? Since Jesus passed by, since Jesus passed by, oh, what a difference since Jesus passed by. Well, I can't explain it, and I cannot tell you why, but oh, what a difference since Jesus passed by. Amen. Oh, that's good. Father, we thank you for this morning now, and Lord, what a difference it makes when Jesus passed by. And Lord, I'm praying that you'll pass by this morning, make a difference in our service here today. Thank you for your goodness to us, and I'm praying, God, that you'll honor and bless the, the preaching of the Word of God this morning. Give me clarity as I bring the message, Lord. I pray that you'll use your Word in our hearts and lives. Lord, I, I pray that we'll leave in a little bit rejoicing and thanking you what a difference Jesus Christ has made in our lives. Lord, have your way in every heart and life. In Jesus' name, amen. In the book of Jude, of course, written by the half-brother of our Lord, they shared the same mother. They did not share the same father. Uh, Joseph was the father of Jude. Joseph was not the father of Jesus. God was the father of Jesus. And, uh, but Jude writes an epistle here, just a short chapter epistle, but he's warning against false teaching coming into the church. In fact, he, what he's urging uh, in the, the epistle here, verse number 3, he says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, he said, I wanted to just write to you about salvation and how wonderful it is to be saved. He said, But it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you 
that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. <clears throat> He's, he says, I've got to uh, uh, help you to stand for the faith that's been passed down that was delivered to the saints. He's going to talk about some of the false teachers and some of the false teaching that had crept into the church. He talks about Israel's unbelief. He'll talk about the angels and their rebellion. He'll talk about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and their immorality. He'll talk about Korah and his rebellion. He'll talk about Cain and his self-will. He'll talk about Balaam and his greediness and, and his covetousness. And he sums it all up down in verse 19 after he deals with all these uh, false teaching and false teachers. And he says, These be they, verse 19, who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit. In other words, these people who I just talked about, they are not saved. They are not believers. They have not the Spirit. That's a capital S. That's the Spirit of God. Every person who's saved, every person who knows Christ as their Savior, has the Spirit of God living in them. If you don't have the Spirit of God in you, then you're not a Christian. Uh, that's not me saying that. That's the Bible saying that. Romans 8 and verse 9 says, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The moment you received Christ your Savior, your body became the temple, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Talked about it in Sunday school this morning. God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I think we had a question the other night at the prison uh, about uh, what, who's the, what's the Holy Spirit. And a lot of people think that's a what. Or it's a uh, some... Some, as the Mormon church believes, that it's just a substance. Well, it's not a substance, and it's not a what, it's a who. It's God the Holy Spirit. And He indwells you the moment you receive Christ as your Savior. But not only does the Holy Spirit come and take up residence, and we become the temple of the Holy Spirit, but Christ Himself comes to live within us. The Bible says in Ephesians 3 and verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love. So Christ comes to dwell by faith in our hearts. And you know, having Jesus Christ in your heart, having Jesus Christ in your life makes all the difference. It makes a big difference in your life. You'll have a relationship that can never be abolished. You'll have a righteousness that can never be tarnished. You'll have an acceptance that can never be questioned. You'll have a standing that can never be shaken. You'll have a justification that can never be reversed. You'll have a seal that can never be broken. You'll have an inheritance that can never be alienated. You'll have a wealth that can never be depleted. You'll have a possession that can never be measured. And you'll have a strength that can never be weakened. All because of what Jesus has done in your life. And because Jesus dwells in you. And Jesus is full of compassion. You'll hear more about that this evening, but that's how we can have compassion. Uh, ordinarily, if we're left to ourselves, we won't be very compassionate. Or at, at best, our compassion will be misplaced. And we'll have passion and compassion and we'll feel for others uh, and, and it'll be misplaced in the wrong areas. And we won't care about things we ought to care about and things that we shouldn't care about. That's what we tend to, we tend to care about. But Jesus gives us the compassion and that's where we get the compassion to make a difference. Jude goes on to say here that we're to build up ourselves in verse 20 on our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. We're to keep ourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then under eternal life. Then he says, of some have compassion making a difference. And that compassion, I believe, comes from Jesus Christ. He had compassion on the crowd when they had no shepherd. We're going to read that in just a moment. He had compassion on the sick among the, the people that came to hear Him. He had compassion on the crowd when they didn't have any food. He had compassion when He healed two blind men. He had compassion on the leper. He had compassion with the man, who with the maniac of Gadara who was possessed with a legion of demons. He had compassion on the widow whose son, only son, had passed away. What a difference. 
Jesus makes. I believe Jesus Christ, the most compassionate man that ever walked the face of the earth and, and, and lived and showed us and taught us compassion. He tells he had compassion as he healed the sick, as he fed the hungry, as he opened the blind eyes. Look over with me, if you would please, at Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 this morning, the first book of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 9. In verse number 35, the Bible says, Matthew 9 and verse 35, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Notice he had compassion on them in verse 36, because they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And what did Jesus say in John 10? He said, I am the good shepherd, and I give my life for the sheep. When Jesus asked, when you ask Jesus to forgive your sin and you ask Him to be your Savior, He became your shepherd and you became one of His sheep. And now He cares for you. And He provides for you. And He guides you and He leads you. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. I'm thankful I heard his voice when I was only six years old. This young man heard his voice when he was 12 years old. I don't know what age you were, and it doesn't matter what age you were. The important thing is, did you hear his voice? Did you hear his call to you? And you answer the call. On that day when I received Christ as my Savior, He made a difference in my life. He made a difference in my life. And He'll make a difference in your life. Not only does He give me eternal life in heaven, but He gives me strength and He gives me comfort and He gives me healing and He gives me guidance and He gives me protection. He provides for my every need. Just like He supplied the food for those 5,000 that day, He's provided for me just as He Open the eyes of the blind man. He opens my eyes to the things of God, the things that are right and the things that are wrong. Just as He, listen, He guides me and leads me. He lets me know what's right, lets me know what's not right, lets me know what I should do, and lets me know what I ought not to do. The great thing about it is I don't just know Him. He knows me. I don't know. I was thinking as I was writing this, I don't think I know any famous people. Okay? I don't know any, any uh, you know, people who we would think, wow, they're really, uh, that's really impressive that you know that person. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I know anybody, but I know this. I know Jesus. And the great thing is, Jesus knows me. And if you're saved, you know Jesus, and He knows you. And, and, and he, he makes the greatest difference in your life. You know what's great about Jesus? He knows all about your faults. He knows all about your failures. He knows all about you and He still loves you anyway. So often, so often people are fearful to share things even with some people who they call their friends because they're fearful if they knew that about them, they wouldn't like them anymore. They wouldn't want to be their friend. You know, Jesus knows all about you and He still loves you and He still wants to be your friend. Isn't that a wonderful thing? What a difference Jesus makes. He'll do the same for you. He'll make a difference in your life if you'll but ask Him to. I want you to look at a few places with me this morning about when Jesus made a difference. Look at John chapter 6 with me, would you please? John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, beginning in verse number 5, Jesus, the Bible says, when Jesus lifted up His eyes and saw a great company come unto Him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. 
And Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There's a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto the disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is the truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Well, the feeding of the 5,000, a familiar story to us, uh, recorded in the Gospels. And, uh, but John is interesting to let us know where the disciples got the loaves and the fishes. They got it from a little boy. A lad here, as Andrew says, and, and it, it, it certainly was enough. In fact, when they found the kid and they looked at his lunch, uh, Jesus said, where, how are we going to feed everybody? And they, they looked at the five loaves and the two small fishes, and they even said, what's that going to do with all this crowd? Okay? And Jesus said, bring it to me. And that little boy was willing to bring what he had and give it to Jesus. You see, it isn't what you have that's important. Are you willing to give it to Jesus? That's the important thing. Are you willing to allow Him to use whatever you have? And if you bring what you have to Him, He can do some amazing things with it. We think you're, you think your possessions or your talents are small? Well, just give them to Jesus. He'll make a difference in the lives of others with what you give to Him. He'll multiply what He gives, what we give to Him. He, he makes it more than what we ever could have done with it. That little boy couldn't have done anything. You know, it's amazing. Uh, not only did they feed everybody, it wasn't like, you know, last night we had the stuffed chicken breasts and, and uh, that, and we had to say, everybody just take one. You didn't have to have that. When they fed the 5,000 that day, how much can we take? Hey, take as much as you want. And you know, they, 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 they took as much as they want. They were all filled, the Bible says. They said, oh, no, I couldn't take another bite. And they still took up 12 baskets full, and these were big baskets. It's an amazing thing what God did that day, what Jesus did. He multiplies what we give to Him. You know what's interesting? Did you notice verse 6? When Jesus said, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? In verse 5, notice verse 6. This He said to prove Him. Proving Philip. Why? For He Himself knew what He would do. You think, Everything when you come to a point in your life and you say, well, I'm not sure what I should do. And, and you know, the, can I tell you this? God knows, already knows what you should do. And Jesus is doing this to prove Philip. Why? Philip was a very calculating fellow. I think he asked Philip, because Philip probably already figured out how many people there and if everybody had a certain portion, just how, much, how many sandwiches or how much bread or how much everything they'd have to have. And so he, he knew. See, that's why Philip said, you know, 200 penny worth is enough to feed this group. He already had it figured out. Are you one of those people who figures it all out? And tells God why what, what you have available isn't good enough or isn't big enough or isn't uh, sufficient enough to do what he's asking you to do? Or will you just give it to him? Is he proving you about some things? To whether you'll give it to him and trust him are you leaning to your own understanding? Are you in all your ways acknowledging Him and saying, God, I don't see how. I don't see how you can make anything out of this mess we have or anything out of this situation I'm in. I don't know how you could ever be glorified in this, but God, I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you, Jesus. Make a difference. And He will. He'll make a difference. He'll turn your mess into a message that others will be, will, be, will be filled and others will be blessed by it. Jesus knows what I have and He knows what you have. And He knows what He can do with it if you'll just give it to Him. If we'll just make it available to Him. We have to give it. The lad had to be willing to give. Do you think, think what, a difference, what a difference that made in his day? 
Yeah, I can imagine him going home. Can you imagine him getting home that night to his mom? I don't know. Some say, well, 12 baskets, all 12 disciples got one. I don't know. I don't know if they didn't stack those 12 up right outside his house. And his mom, mom, you better come out of here. You got to see this. I wonder if she went out and looked at all that food and said, what in the world have you done? He goes, you won't believe it. You know that lunch you gave me today? I gave it to Jesus. You gave your lunch away? Oh, where did all this come from? Oh, that's the best part. Huh? Can you imagine him telling the story? Wow. What a difference Jesus makes. What a difference Jesus makes. Now I want you to go back one book from John to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. In Luke 8, we meet a man named Jairus. In verse 41 of Luke chapter 8, the Bible says, Behold, there was a man named Jairus, when he was, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had one only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a-dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. You have a little interlude here where a woman meets him with an issue of blood. And imagine now, think about this. You've come to Jesus, by the way, a ruler of the synagogue, not friends with Jesus. This is someone who's giving up his position. He's not going to be a ruler in the synagogue if he believes in Jesus. So he's losing his job. Why would he lose his job? Because he wants to save his daughter. His daughter's sick. <clears throat> and so he goes to Jesus, and Jesus agrees to come. And about that time, there's such a crowd, and, and Jesus goes, and you're going to find out Jesus stops. And he says, somebody touched me. This woman that had the issue of blood, she touched Jesus, and he stops. And I can imagine Jairus thinking, come on, we don't have time to stop. What are you doing? My daughter's dying. And he waits. Jesus deals with this woman. And, he, and it's a delay for Jairus. And so he takes care of the woman, Jesus does, and heals her of her uh, uh, infirmity. And then verse number 49, While he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying unto him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. Oh, I knew we shouldn't have waited. I knew you should have ignored that woman. Now my daughter's dead. It's over. Can I remind you it's never over till God says it's over? No, it's not over when you say it's over. It's not over till God says it's over. Oh, they looked and said, it's dead. Don't, don't trouble him anymore. But wait. When Jesus heard it, verse 50, He answered him saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And He kept walking. How do I know he kept walking? Because verse 51 says, When he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John and the father and the mother of the maiden. And by the way, you'll find out in, in another passage where they record this, the reason they only went in, because they were all mocking him. Because he said, she's not dead, she's just sleeping. Oh no, the funeral music's begun. They're already singing and wailing her death. And Jesus said, and when they laughed him to scorn, he put them all out. He said, you won't get to see this. <laughs> you, won't, you have to believe to see this. And so he just took those five in, Peter, James, John, father and mother, and all wept and bewailed. And he said, see, he said, weep not, she's not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again. What's that tell you? She's dead. Spirit was gone. He called it back. Say, can he do that? He is Jesus. He is God. He can do that. Okay? And he said, uh, Spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished. And he charged them, they should tell no man what was done. What a difference when Jesus passed by. What a difference Jesus made. I can imagine Jairus and his daughter would tell this story over and over and over again in the years to come. And about her being 12 and how she passed away. Maybe some of those folks who laughed at him, they'd tell the story too. Because now they've seen her alive. 
And what do you attribute that to? Jesus Christ. What a difference Jesus makes. Jairus would say, he sure made a difference in my life. I got my daughter now. I thought it was gone. I thought she was gone. And she was. She was dead. But you know what? Jesus brought her back to life. Hey, what, what situation is it in your life? What relationship in your life you think is dead? No hope. Beyond repair. Nothing, no, nothing anybody can do. Why don't you bring it to Jesus? Let Jesus bring it back to life. Don't sell Jesus short. Don't, the arm of the Lord is not shortened. He can do anything. Don't give up on Jesus. You just give to Him. What a difference Jesus will make if you'll just give it to Him. Later on in, in a, a, a earlier, rather, in Luke 8, would you go a little earlier in the chapter? Verse number 22. We find another situation when Jesus made a difference. It came to pass on a certain day, Luke 8 and verse 22, that he went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Disciples get in the ship with Jesus. Just to go to the other side, a ship uh, in, a, in a journey, I'm sure as fishermen, they took many times. And a storm swept down on the Sea of Galilee like it would be prone to do. But they'd been through many of those storms. But this one was a bad one. And the water was uh, coming into the boat. It's okay for the boat to be in the water. It's not okay for the water to be in the boat. Amen. And so they knew they were in trouble. And they go to Jesus and they wake him up and say, Master, Master, we're, we're going to die. Now Jesus didn't get all excited because he didn't come to die in, in a boat wreck. Okay? He didn't come to die in a boat storm. He knew what he came to do. So he wasn't, he wasn't too worried about it. And he got up and he just spoke to the winds and the waves and all of a sudden there was a calm. And, and the Bible says they said one to another. Whoa. That's in the Greek. You've got to dig deep for that. Whoa. Look at this. What manner of man is this? Who is this? Wow. What a Can he speak and the winds and the waves obey him? Yeah. You know why? He created them. He made them. But, but didn't He make you and me? Well, if He speaks to us, shouldn't we obey Him? You see, I don't think the disciples ever forgot that. Peter surely never forgot that. Those disciples saw Him heal the sick and raise the dead and make the lame to walk, the blind to see. In fact, it impressed them so much they forsook all and begin to follow Him. They gave everything they had for Jesus Christ. What a difference Jesus makes. I want to be a little personal with you if you let me do that this morning. My, my dad was a baseball player. He was a pitcher. He was in the St. Louis Cardinals organization. And um, it was spring training of 1953. And in kind of a inner squad game type thing they were playing. He, he had a line drive hit back at him. Those of you who play baseball, it was a knuckleball that came back at him. It comes off the bat with no spin on it. And so the ball really dances around like a butterfly. And he got his, uh, he was left-handed, he got his glove up, but the thing took a little tip right at the top. It tipped off the top of his glove and went right into his left eye. And um, he ended up, the eye... I won't gross you out, but the eye came out. He ended up losing that eye. And um, he <clears throat> tried to come back as he healed up and uh, things like that. In fact, he was one of the men who came in to see him in the hospital was Stan Musial. If you're a baseball fan, you might remember that name. 
Stan, they call him Stan the Man Musial. And so when I came along a few years later, he called me Stan, okay? Um, I'm Stan the Man Slave Hall, okay? I want you to know that. <laughs> Why are you laughing? No. <laughs> he tried coming back, and, and he, he, he would say, and, and I have a scrapbook in my office, and, um, you know, he, the, the trouble he had at first, when he would throw too hard, he had a plastic eye that he stuck in his eye. And sometimes when he threw too hard, that would pop out. And so you imagine, imagine that, he'd have to bend over and pick his eyeball up, and, you know, after he pitched the ball. And, uh, and, and so, and then he, if he didn't put, you know, of course, he, he, what he struggled with was depth perception. If somebody laid down a bunt, you, you couldn't tell how fast it was coming or where it was going, and uh, he, he struggled with that. And so he didn't make it all the way back to the major league level. And, but he told me years later, he said he believed God allowed that to happen to him because he was drifting away from God. You know, baseball was becoming everything to him, playing on Sunday, not going to church. And dad returned to his hometown of Hartville, Ohio, got a job and started a family. He worked at the F.E. Schumacher Company in Hartville, Ohio. And as far back as I remember, uh, I don't ever remember a time where we didn't go to church three times a week. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. In fact, when we moved from one part of the city to another part of the country, really, in those days, um, when we moved further away, we, if he ever was looking for a church for us to consider to, to change churches, if they didn't have Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, they weren't even on the list to consider a service, to consider us attending. That was my dad. And that's how I was brought up. <clears throat> there were... There were some difficulties. He, uh, my mom and dad got divorced when I was in seventh grade, just before I went into seventh grade. And, but I watched my dad continue in the faith. My dad had one of those situations where growing up, we went to church. My mom rarely went to church. Uh, she said all the right things until they got married. And then she didn't want anything to do with going to church or anything. And they got divorced when I was going into seventh grade. And as I said, I watched my dad stay faithful. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, he, he just stayed right at it. He kept the faith. Never wavered. <clears throat> Three of his brothers... My dad's brothers were all drinkers, smokers. Two of the brothers didn't rear their families in church at all. Several of their children and even their grandchildren don't acknowledge God at all in their lives. But I believe that I'm a preacher today and my sister, my younger sister, is married to a preacher in Oklahoma. And I believe that's because of my dad. Staying, uh, allowing Jesus to make a difference in his life. Staying by the stuff. Jesus made a difference in his life. And he made a difference in our lives. You see, it was my dad who would listen to Jack Hiles on the radio when I would get up in the morning on Sundays. He'd be shaving in the bathroom and I can still close my eyes and see him shaving there and he's shaving there with his eyeball laying on the sink, you know, and, and uh, the radio playing and it would always be, it was a program called Let's Go Soul Winning. That's what Jack Hiles had on and uh, he would always be interviewing. Then those days, the Sunday school class basically was him interviewing a couple that had got saved that week and he would interview them and talk about their conversion. I remember hearing that. It was my dad who had the sword of the Lord delivered to our house. And I started reading the sermons by John Rice and Lee Robertson and heard about a fellow named Lester Roloff. And <clears throat> when Lester Roloff brought his girls in the Roloff homes, some of you don't even know who that is. And uh, great, he had, he had a home for 
men and women and boys and girls and such down in Corpus Christi, Texas. And uh, he brought a bunch of them to a football stadium not far from where we were. And we kept a couple of girls at our home during that time. It's, I, I, I wouldn't be where I am now if it weren't for the path that my dad took. I don't know if he realized at the time. Often, uh, we, we, we talked about it at times. My brother and I, when my brother was here, talked about what, what, what a difference our lives would have been if that wouldn't have happened to my dad. We'd have probably grown up in Major League Baseball parks. We'd have grown up with spring training. We'd have grown up going to ball games. But I probably wouldn't. Who knows if we'd have gotten saved? Who knows if we'd have ever done anything for God? But the reason we have is because what a difference Jesus made in my dad's life. And he listened to what the Lord said. You know, you don't know the decisions you make now that's going to affect your children and your grandchildren. Hmm? Oh, what a difference when Jesus passes by. What a difference Jesus makes in our life. There's one more person I want us to look at, and that's in Mark chapter 10. Would you look there with me, please? Mark chapter 10. In Mark 10 and verse number 46, would you look at that with me, please? <clears throat> they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him <coughs> that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garments, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? Thou, the blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Here's the blind man Bartimaeus sitting by the highway. They would sit by the highway coming in out of a city because that's where they'd get some money. Uh, they'd beg and that's how they got whatever they could get to buy some food and to eke out a living, and eke out an existence. But he heard... The, blind, the eyes couldn't see, but his ears worked well. And he heard of Jesus was in town. And he had heard about Jesus Christ. That's why it's important for you to talk about Him. That's why it's important for you to discuss Him because other people hear what Jesus can do. And he heard, and he began to cry out, Jesus, thou Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus! And you know what? Did you see verse number 48? Many charged him he should hold his peace. Don't bother him. Don't bother, don't bother Jesus. Oh, he wasn't going to be denied. <laughs> he cried out the more. He just got louder. And, and he kept crying out for Jesus. And the great thing is, Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Bring him to me. And then they brought him to him. And he gave him his sight. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Doesn't even say here, Jesus touched him. He just spoke the word. He can do that, you know. He can speak the word and change everything. And this guy got his sight. He said, go your way. You have your sight. But he didn't go his way, did he? He got his sight and what did he do? Follow Jesus. <laughs> he said, no, I'm staying with you. Now I can see you and you gave me your sight. I'm following you. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was blind, lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. That's our testimony. That's us. That's you and me. Because of Jesus Christ. What a difference Jesus makes. Has He made a difference in your life? If He's not made any difference in your life, you haven't met Him. You don't know Him. Knowing about Him doesn't change your life. Knowing Him 
changes your life. You may be, you may be, if you're a youngster here and you're in church, or you're a teenager and you're in church, and you kind of think, well, man, I'm growing up in church. I've been around this all my life. Yeah, but do you know Him? He makes a difference when you know Him. What a difference Jesus makes. Call out to Him like Blind Bartimaeus did. Call upon Him. You'll see firsthand what a difference Jesus makes. You know what He'll do? He'll take a drug addict of 25 years and He'll turn him into Danny Wright who preaches to drug addicts and, and those who are captive by stubborn habits. And those who are infirmed in the nursing home makes them a whole different person. What a difference Jesus makes. He'll take a computer programmer and turn him into a missionary. How many years, Brother Jarvis? A missionary? Do you remember? 20? 96? Okay. 22, coming up on 22 years. What a difference Jesus makes. Ask, ask the Van Sickles what difference did Jesus make. Hmm? Makes a difference. Ask Fred Messer what a difference Jesus makes. Ask Chuck Linderman what a difference Jesus makes in his life. He'll make a difference in your life as well. Hmm? Oh, what a difference when Jesus passes by. When Jesus passed by, when Jesus passed by, oh, what a difference when Jesus passed by. Well, I can't explain it, and I cannot tell you why, but oh, what a difference when Jesus Passed by. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you, Jesus, for all you do for us. For not only saving us, but caring for us. Watching over us. Strengthening us. Comforting us. Guiding us. Leading us. Providing for us. Thank you for being our Savior. Thank you for being our Shepherd. Thank you for passing by and what a difference you make in our lives. And Lord, I pray this morning that each of us would look at our life and some of us are in families where brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins don't know you. And Lord, there's no reason why you would have had us hear the gospel. No reason why you pass by us. But Lord, we're so grateful for the difference that Jesus has made in our lives. And I'm praying this morning, if any in the room have never experienced that, that they'd receive Christ as their Savior today. And then there'd be numbers of believers here this morning who would just pause to say on this first Sunday of January 2018, thank you, Jesus, for what a difference you make in my life. I don't know where I'd be without you. Maybe some ought to bow the knee and thank, thank you for godly parents where Jesus made a difference or they wouldn't be where they are today. Father, speak to hearts today. I pray that some who are in difficult situations, some are praying for a miracle and Lord, I pray that they take the little they have, the shattered dreams, the broken relationships, whatever it is, and they just bring it to Jesus and say, Jesus, will you do something with this? And I pray, God, that they'd step back and they'd see you do exceeding abundantly above all they could ever ask or think. Please help them bring it to you and see what a difference Jesus makes.